Coming up on American Black Journal, an important conversation about how the holidays are a really lonely time for the homeless and the disadvantaged. We're gonna talk with two Detroit nonprofits that are helping to make the season a little brighter by providing help and hope for those in need. Plus, we're gonna take you to a contemporary art exhibit that focuses on African-American life here in Detroit. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. The holiday season is here, and for many, it is a joyous time filled with family and friends and, of course, plenty of food. But for the homeless and the disadvantaged, it's a more difficult time. They don't know where their next meal is coming from, and they don't necessarily have a warm home to call their own. My first guests are on the front line helping the homeless and others in need during the holidays and beyond. Here's my conversation with Dr. Chad Audie of the Detroit Rescue Mission Ministries and Linda Little from Neighborhood Service Organization. I think this is a really important subject to think about and to be talking about this time of year because it's something that um, that I think a lot of people don't remember to think about. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a really bright time of year for so many of us and we look forward to it. Uh, all year, but for a lot of folks, it produces a lot of anxiety about really basic, really basic needs. Um, I just want to start with having each of you talk about what kind of landscape we, we're looking at here in Detroit with regard to homelessness and the disadvantaged this time of year, and the kind of challenges that they are likely to uh, to encounter. Linda, I'll start with you. Well, first, Stephen, I want to say thank you for bringing light to this matter right now, because you're absolutely right. Um, and with the pandemic, we, lost, we saw a lot of heads of households that were affected by COVID-19 who are no longer with us. And so what we've seen at NSO is a lot of those families are really struggling mm. um, to make ends meet and, and meet those basic needs for their family. We're seeing a tremendous increase in homelessness of women and children. Um, I've had some conversations with city and other, the city and other providers in our community about what we can do right now, we at NSO can do right now. Um, and we are starting a housing first fund um, thanks to United Healthcare, Huntington Bank, and uh, Meridian Health Plan, we're able to put some dollars in a pool for all those calls that we get to help people stay in their homes. That ev eviction moratorium is now lifted, and people just aren't able to pay that back rent. So we want to keep people housed during this cold season. You know, we offer a full continuum of homeless mm. solutions, but let's first keep people housed. Let's try to keep people in their current homes. Yeah. So that's what our Housing First program is going to do. So so I, I guess I'm a, uh, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm a little surprised to, to hear you say that you feel like things are worse, that they that they haven't gotten better uh, since the end of, of the pandemic. Can you talk more about, about what you're seeing? Absolutely. Um, so the impact of the severe loss um, that we experienced during that time we know will affect us for some time to come. Um, complete families were disrupted. If you think about the thousands that were lost just in Detroit, 
and the impact that of those mothers, the children, the fathers who lost grandparents. Um, you and I know, Stephen, many of people in our friend circle that succumbed to COVID-19. So that impact is gonna be lasting. The root of homelessness, Stephen, is poverty. Mm -hmm. So when you lose a breadwinner, when you lose that second income earner in a household, it becomes untenable in many cases to sustain the household that they had. And so that's what we're seeing right now. Chad, uh, I want to hear from you as well about uh, what you feel like we're confronting uh, in this community and, and what it looks like. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, this time of the year has not been what we expected. Uh, I mean, we have been working diligently with a lot of other organizations in the city to make sure that the homeless individuals' numbers will be less, but unfortunately, right now is way higher, as Linda was talking, especially for women and children, and also for men as well, the number is not decreasing at all. Uh, matter of fact, the latest report showed that there was about uh, twenty, about seven percent increase over the last year of uh, homelessness, and those are due to to many many factors. Um, Linda had shed light on the uh, COVID nineteen impact, but also the economy. I don't. The inflation is a big part of it. We see also there was a lot of uh, are not able to get food on their tables. The increase for uh, requesting of food, so food insecurity becoming a very big issues. Uh, but uh, and and right now uh, we are in discussion that we would have to open another 600 bed for the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. As we speak right now, there is a lot of talks about how can we come up with 600 beds which uh, we are already working on now. I mean, we're providing probably about 400 so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know NSO is going to be working and a lot of other organizations gathering together. The good things about Detroit, that we have a good uh, organizations and good people with good heart that they will do what needs to be done. But the fact remain, we have an issue with homelessness and it's growing, it's not going down. Yeah, we have issues of substance abuse. We have issues of mental health that created a big impact on uh, affecting the number of homelessness. So uh, I wish today I would have been able to say the numbers are going down. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the numbers are not going down and we need uh, to do way more work. And uh, the bottom line, we need more housing, which is there's not enough stock in Detroit anyway. And this is a major thing that we would have to work on. Uh, where do we take the people off the shelter and the warming center after we bring them in? And how are we going to work with them so they can get back on their feet so they will get off homelessness? That's the major issue that we're facing today. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I think is always really important to, to emphasize when we talk about homelessness uh, in Detroit is the fluidity of uh, of the problem. Uh, in other words, uh, I think a lot of people think there is kind of just a permanent homeless population and that's what needs we need, need to meet. Um, uh, but but really the, the, the face of, of poverty and homelessness in, in, in Detroit really comes and goes. I mean, somebody uh, gets fired from a job or or has a medical emergency or has to have a car repair in a month and all of a sudden they're facing this kind of crisis that they, they weren't last month and and that's a different kind of um, problem to have to manage I think than than people who are who are permanently un, unhoused uh, Chad I'll give I'll go I'll start with you first this time just to talk about that challenge in particular and 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 what it calls on us to do well you know like you're mentioning there is a big difference between chronic homeless and the homeless that happens due to certain factors that affect their life uh, we all are one or two paycheck away from being ho uh, homeless ourselves and the issue that we are seeing today is uh, you have households uh, head of households who has who no longer are with us affected the families uh, and they needed a place to go so they're not going to be able to make end meets 
we have a big inflation that causing a lot of people not to be able to save any money for emergencies. So at any uh, any emergency happen in their life, they're immediately going to lose their homes and become homeless. Um, there is not, despite the fact that everybody's thinking there is a lot of job, there's not really a lot of jobs, uh, especially available for people with no high skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, so, so, so those are impacting the population that we are working with. And then we're seeing, and then the high rent and the high of the property, you know, the price of the property and the rent increase. So somebody right now with four children, if they're making $40,000, they can't afford living in a home by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so where do they go and what can we do? And then, yes, we, I mean, we commence uh linda for example when they do housing first model because that's exactly who can benefit from them instead of going somewhere else uh but 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 this again we have an issue with the stock of the housing and we have an issue of how can we uh find an economic stability for the family so they would not be homeless at any given time yeah uh, linda yeah, I, I agree with everything that said. And, you know, in Detroit, I, I work with McKinsey as our thought partner. We've done affordable housing summits, brought in key stakeholders from every sector of our community um, to discuss this issue because it is impacting everyone, workers everywhere. Um, if you live, work, or play in Detroit, this problem is affecting you. And, and so we need to bring real solutions from funding the housing unit crisis that we have, and then policies. If somebody is, we, we just started a medical respite program for the homeless. So if they're discharged from the hospital, they'll have a safe place to get continuing care. But we had to work with the continuum so that that stay post-discharge from the hospital doesn't count against them mm -hmm. when they're looking for housing solutions because mm -hmm. the policy says if you stay someplace for one day, you have to start all over again. Yeah. We need to look at these things that there are things that we can do from a systematic approach that can help alleviate the perpetuation of homelessness in, in the climate that we are serving in. And then also, you know, 30% of Detroiters spend 70% of their income on housing. Yeah. Just housing. They are literally one small crisis away from not being able to pay their rent or their mortgage on time. Yeah. We have to solve that issue as well. You know, we need to look at, um, McKinsey is working with um, world leaders on an economic empowerment line. Instead of the poverty line, let's go to economic empowerment so that people can actually live and afford where they live. We have a real problem. We're on the precipice of a crisis here, but I believe in Detroit and people yeah. are coming together to talk about how we go upstream and not just fix the, the shelter bed issue. We have to do that, but let's go upstream and let's address some of these economic factors that are impacting families. You know, like that's how we started this fund, this Housing mm -hmm. First Fund to keep people in their current housing and let's work with them to address the root cause of that destabilization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we before we have to end, I, I want to have each of you talk a little about what people can do uh, to help uh, this population during the holidays. Linda, I'll start with you this time. What should people be thinking about? So first of all, if you're homeless, if you're suffer suffering any type of housing instability right now, it's cold outside. Mm. Get ahead of it. Call our coordinated assessment model, the CAM. It's also known 313-305-0311. And let them know, see what you can, what you're eligible for. If you're an NSO client, give us a call at our 888-360-WELL number, and we can help try to keep you in your housing. But if you are a concerned citizen of Detroit, which I know we have so many citizens who care about all our entire community, donate, um, donate to organizations like Detroit Rescue Mission, like NSO, um, so that we can help people collectively and have collective impact. It's great to help people on the street. You know, I have a lot of friends who give, you know, goodie bags and, and, and clothes, socks to people on the street. That's fantastic. But 
we have to donate to organizations like NSO, Detroit Rescue Mission, so that we can have collective impact. And uh, you could do that by going to our website at www.nso-mi.org. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chad, what uh, what what you would you recommend for people? You know, the first thing people, when they look, sometimes they get confused with pe between people who are homeless and people who are panhandlers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives the perception, the panhandler gives the perception of homelessness, but they're not really uh, homeless. Mm -hmm. And the people who are homeless are people who are like me and like everyone else. Uh, they're not a second class citizen. They're a good human being, but they're just going through some hard times. And they come to organizations like NSO or DRMM to get help. And therefore, we encourage people, instead of uh, helping a person to stay on the street, to help organization take them off the street and find a solution to their situation so they can put them into a not no longer in harm way, but to be in a peaceful situation. So I urge people to understand that homelessness is not a pain handling situation and to support organizations like NSO, like DRMM, and they can do so. And if they see anybody on the street and they really need help, they can always call CAM or they can call directly our numbers at 313-993-4700. And if for help, they can always go to our website at drmm.org and then we will be very thankful, like we always been to the generosity of Detroiters. An exhibit of creative works exploring the Black experience in Detroit is on display at the Cranbrook Art Museum. It's called Skilled Labor, Black Realism in Detroit, and it features paintings, drawings, and art installations from 20 contemporary artists. One Detroit producer, Sarah Zentarski, visited the museum and spoke with some of the artists who are involved in the project. It's a historical exhibition, absolutely. This exhibition really demonstrates the legacy of really genius here in Detroit, Michigan. It's about artists who engage with each other and support each other and build with each other. And I think that's the biggest thing. We are located at Cranbrook Museum of Art in Bloomfield Hills, um, right next to the Academy. The idea of this exhibition actually came through curator Laura Mott. We thought about the last 10 years of uh, Detroit contemporary art for black realism and highlight, you know, the artists that we wanted to highlight. This is the all-star game right here. You know, everybody in here is an incre absolutely incredible painter and artist. The name of the exhibition is Skilled Labor, Black Realism in Detroit. And what I believe it means specifically for me uh, as a co-curator is thinking about labor in general, um, but specifically labor in Detroit. So each artist in the exhibition handles that uh, differently. So everybody's work does not look the same. Uh, they don't approach realism the same, um, but it's a spectrum of, of artistic ideas that are approaching this subject matter. I like how it touches every corner of, of a black experience in, in each portrait. I think one successful way that this exhibition carries the black body or the black narrative is that it showcases a number of artists who have a diverse, although similar and yet dynamic narrative uh, that isn't just confined to the identity, the political identity of blackness itself, which is just based on the colorism of it, but more so people's background, talking about uh, themes of liberation, themes of empowerment, uh, empathy, uh, themes of even migration. You know, you also see moments of joy, families bonding, uh, pain. So it's it, it's successful in the sense that it gives artists the opportunity and also the viewers to who, who come to see the show uh, a, a big depth and breadth and scope of like all these narratives combined. You'll see uh, a lot of work that deals with the muralistic tradition in Detroit and there's drawing, there's um, painting, and there's also an aspect of installation, specifically Rashawn Rucker's work and Sidney James' work. So there's all of these different aspects for viewers to kind of really get involved in something beyond their general idea when they think about realistic art. For me to be a part of this conversation of Detroit re realism, of Detroit legacy, is truly an honor 
my painting is hanging alongside Huber Massey, who was my teacher who, who literally provided me the foundations of figure drawing. So it is truly an honor. My painting is titled Bound for the Land of Canaan Land, which is really very much inspired by Detroit's history with the Underground Railroad. One of the hymns that was sang during um, the enslaved route was a song called Bound for the Land of Canaan Land. And so Canaan Land was cold word for Canada. My interpretation of Black realism is, for me, is trying to paint the Black soul. Um, I'm trying my hardest to portray Blackness in a way that conveys a lot of vulnerability, intimacy, and asks the viewer to interrogate and investigate what they're seeing and what they're perceiving. Derek behind me is my best friend's brother. Derek is full of culture. Now from his, the way his hat, the way he put, ties bandana around the hat, to his earrings, to his chains, to everything. And these are things that we have kind of pushed culturally for so long in like the pockets of our society. It gets to the point where people judge these attributes of blackness as a negative of blackness and not a, a wholeness of it and not a beautiful part of it. And it's not negative, it's, it's culture, it's bravado, it's beautiful. It's, there's nothing, he's not doing anything wrong. So I like to paint him in his state and ask you, if you do have a problem, if you do feel uneasy with this type of image of, of blackness, then where is that coming from? So there are two pieces that I have in this exhibition. Uh, one uh, called Yonder is a piece that was made in 2018 uh, upon graduating here in Cranbrook. The other piece is called Menorah's Volter, and it's a portrait of my wife with her hair braided. And Laura Mark came to my studio and she, she brought up this idea of the anti-portrait, which is a, a discussion that her and Mario Mo were having. I like to pull the viewer in, which is why I feel like realism is really important to me because I want you to feel like as the person looking at the work that you can walk into the space or that the figures in the work are engaging with you in some kind of way. The work that I have in this show is older work. Uh, one work that I made last year uh, during my exhibition that had to deal with the uh, Underground Railroad and, and contemporary Detroit. And then uh, another painting that had to do with uh, medical experimentation on black bodies. What I hope the viewers take from this exhibition is uh, the great or biggest sense of love and vulnerability and coping me mechanisms and the drive for growth and liberation. I hope that viewers understand the rich legacy of Black artists in Detroit to understand that, you know, we're here, we've always been here, and as we are looking at younger generations that this legacy will continue. There's so much talent and there's so much richness and, and, and cultural depth that I would hope that when people see this and they say, oh, everybody here's a Detroit artist, they take a trip down to the D. That's what I hope. And you can see the skilled labor of Black realism in Detroit exhibit at the Cranbrook Art Museum in Bloomfield Hills through March 3rd. That is going to do it for us this week. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. Plus, connect with us anytime on social media. Take care, and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. 
Thank you.